it's really hard to disentangle what is actually real sometimes in terms of color and what is actually being interpreted by your brain. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to Mind Matters, everyone. Today in the studio, we've got Carolyn joining us again and Adam. Hello. And we are interviewing Katie Tregillis, PhD. She is an expert on color adaptation. That is her field. So we are going to be talking about all kinds of weird things about vision and how your perception of color changes in certain circumstances and the, the long and short-term adaptations to color perception and things of that sort. So looking forward to it. Welcome, Katie, to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm uh, Katie. I'm currently a postdoc researcher at the University of Minnesota. Um, and like you said, I study uh, color and adaptation to color. Um, I do a little bit of work with uh, fMRI, looking at the brain's responses to color. Um, and yeah, great. that's my current job. <laughs> cool. Well, the, the, the way in which I found you was um, we had... A few of us had here had engaged in a in a quite heated debate at times about one of those viral um, pictures. Like uh, I think the first one was, I don't know if it was five six years ago. The 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 dress is this dress blue and blue and black or gold and white, and um, and then shortly after that there was another one about the shoes. Are they are they blue and it's like pink and white and, teal and, and yeah. yeah yeah teal and gray yeah teal and gray and teal pink and, gray. and white. Mm -hmm. Pink and white, yeah. So I, so I searched around and found this this paper of yours. We'll include a link to it, and uh, and maybe any others that you that you think might be of interest to our viewers and listeners. This one's uh, long term adaptation to color, um, by you and Stephen A. Engel, and it's kind of like an overview of pretty much the like the the, the this kind of field and all the studies that have been done. And one of the things that stood out for me is. Well, I'm, I'm skipping the part I wanted to get to first, but maybe we'll just go with it. The, one of the things that stood out to me is that there hasn't actually been, it seems, a lot of research on on these kinds of color adaptations. So, I get well. I guess to start out with, maybe could you explain to us what we what you mean by uh, color adaptation? So, what what is a specific example of the kind of adaptation you're talking about? Or, yeah, um, actually, this might be a good time for one of the slides I brought. All right. Um, so I, I brought a couple of demos. Sure. Uh, slide four might be a good one to start with. Okay, let's find that. Okay. Cool. So um, this is an example of a very short-term adaptation effect. So if you could just stare at the center dot for a little bit and just leave that for a second. Um, when I switch over to the next slide, um, you should see... Oh, a wow. pretty robust after effect. Mm -hmm. I don't yep. know if everybody so you can do it again. It works kind of really well if you go back and forth a little bit. Um, but this is an example of uh, what we call an after image or an after effect. Um, this is really commonly seen, uh, for example, when you take a picture with flash mm -hmm. and you end up seeing that large black spot in your in the center of your vision for a while. That's another example of an after effect. Um, and essentially what is happening is as you're looking at these colors, your brain is starting to adjust to those colors. And um, after you've adjusted for a little while, your brain is now kind of in a little bit of an altered state. Mm -hmm. So when you would go back to a neutral world, um, the neutral page, uh, you get these really robust after effects. Yeah. This, mm -hmm. Now, that reminds me, because I've, I've seen those before, like I've done after, after image, you know, things. Um, like in books, and I'm sure I've seen them. I, I, like I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I saw them various times when I was going to school, you know, as a kid. Um, and but there's, there's a few other effects like that that I'm sure a lot of our listeners have seen. Like the, the, the one with contrast, where there sometimes it'll be on a checkerboard, um, like a, a chessboard surface, where one of the, one of the tiles looks, um, well, it is gray, but it can either it, it's actually the same color as maybe one of the white and one of the black ones, but because of the shadow. It uh, your 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 brain kind of corrects for the um, for the shading, so it's so. So, so it makes not, sense. So it makes sense. Yeah, I'm not describing yeah. it yeah. very well, but 
or or am I? Is there a better way to describe that, Katie? No, I think I think you're describing exactly correct. So essentially, um, similar to what I just showed, your brain is constantly making these adjustments, and mm -hmm. so some of those adjustments happen across space in your vision. So you're kind of compensating for different effects and making these kind of internal calculations about what might be happening in the scene. Mm -hmm. um, so for the example that you gave, where you might see something in shadow, your brain is now compensating for the fact that there appears to be a shadow in that location. So mm -hmm. even though the color might be physically darker, you start to perceive it as lighter because you're kind of compensating for that shadow. You're yeah. getting this context effect. Mm -hmm. And um, adaptation is kind of similar in that way, but it happens across time. So as you're uh, as you start to see things more and more, your brain starts to kind of adjust for what you're looking at um, and make some kind of compensation so that you can perceive something more accurately. Uh, I think the cool thing about a lot of these illusions is that, yes, they are technically you're not seeing what's actually there. That's mm -hmm. what makes them an illusion. But the mechanism exists so that you can see things more accurately in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you talked about the dress. The dress, I think, is a perfect example of this yeah. because a big part of why it happens is because you, some people are perceiving that dress to be kind of in shadow. Mm -hmm. So um, if you look at the image, essentially what's weird about it is that it's really low quality. <laughs> yeah. So it's actually been, it was taken with a really bright flash. Mm -hmm. um, and then in addition to that, in the very top corner of the dress, there's a really bright patch that um, people could perceive to be maybe a window. Um, I think what it actually was, was a mirror that the flash is reflecting off of. Mm. Um, so the people who perceive that to be kind of a mirror would say that this dress is really backlit. Yeah. And those people tend to say that it looks white and gold. Mm -hmm. um, but the people who would perceive, I, I guess, correctly, that there was just a bright flash that's actually washing out the colors of the dress could perceive it to be blue and black. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the kind of explanation that we have right now for the dress as to why it's so 50 50 yeah. is really weird and what makes it such a unique thing mm -hmm. um and made it such an exciting thing yeah. because why were why was it so split we well, still don't have a great answer on that well um there was a paper i i found after reading yours that was on that that uh those pictures or that picture and what the and it was really long. I think it was like thirty pages or something. But <laughs> what they found was what they found was that they could um, basically prime um, subjects to mm -hmm. to see it either as um, you know front lit or back lit. So so they could actually change the numbers of people that would see it in one way or the other. So mm -hmm. I think I think I can't remember if it was like fifty fifty to start out with, but they could like roughly shift it so that seventy five percent of people would see it one way or the other way just by mm -hmm. by giving cues that it was either in i think the way they did it was they they superimposed the dress on um you know a, a wider scene where there's a, a woman wearing the dress where it's obviously you know it's obviously in shadow and one where it's obvious that the sun is shining directly on it and so like so again 75 percent or, or so of people would see it the way it the see it according to the context of the picture around it but there were still mm -hmm. some who weren't which was interesting and there were even some who who saw different colors. It wasn't just those two sets of colors. It was there was a range. I think it was like between three and five different colors for each one. And and I yeah. I, I can't remember. I, I looked at the at the paper weeks ago. But one one when I looked at it, I I could not fathom that anyone could see the the color. You know, one of the colors that was listed. It was a small percentage, mm -hmm. but it was just very strange so yeah <laughs> well that's so that's one of the effects or one of the phenomena that you talk about in the paper is that there are large um, individual differences in in these types of phenomena so could, could you maybe uh, tell us a bit about that or give some examples or just speak on it um sure yeah so the dress i think is one of the best examples of individual differences for perceiving this kind of phenomenon um and there are other kind of bi-stable illusions that are similar to that um not necessarily color ones, but um, there's, I think everybody's probably seen the one with the ballerina that looks like she's turning one direction for mm -hmm. some people in the opposite direction for the other people. Yep. Um, and it's difficult to explain why you get these individual differences. Um, it could be because of certain factors. So some people have tried to correlate things like the dress with age, gender, um, time spent on the internet. There are all kinds of different factors that could be contributing to why you might see it one way or the other. Um, 
is there a like a best guest so far or are is everything kind of like up in the air still it's a little up i think there's a few things i think like older people and women are more likely to see it as white and gold but i don't even Mm. think that's a very strong correlation um i'm not sure about the shoes i that's a little newer and i'm not sure if there's any kind of distinct purpose on that the shoes i think are really interesting because a big part of why people thought the dress worked so well is because it happens on along this daylight locus so Mm. it happens in this blue to yellow region which is where most colors that we see in our daily life exist. Um, And so we tend to confuse them a little bit more than we do say reds and greens. Um, Mm. But the shoe doesn't quite fit that same narrative. So it kind of threw a wrench in some things, I think. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So there's not a great way to figure out what, which people might see these mm-hmm. biostable illusions one way or which people might see them in another, other, another way. Mm-hmm. But what's cool about individual differences is you can actually use them to understand the mechanisms that underlie those things. So you can actually analyze the amount of variance and the number of ways that people vary with these different illusions and start to understand, well, are we consistently getting variation along this certain dimension of yeah stimulus space Mm -hmm. and that can kind of give us a hint as to how many different ways this could be interpretable and how many different mechanisms might underlie Mm -hmm. um that particular perception well one thing that i wanted to sort of maybe i'm jumping ahead a little bit was when you were talking about uh speed of adaptation in your paper when you would you know park somebody in with yellow lenses or red lenses and one thing I thought it was, it was really kind of sad that the sample groups were so small, but I guess it's really yes. hard to persuade a large number of people to let you like, can I screw with your vision for like the next <laughs> month? You know, the, yeah, might be... why don't people want to do that? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> but but I, I sort of had this fleeting idea that, that um, it would have been, would be interesting to run maybe your cohorts through a big five personality. Because we, we mm. actually were talking about this early, you know, earlier today that, there were sort of two hypotheses of, of who uh, adapted the quickest. And we could have gone with either the really conservative, rigid personality would want to snap their world back to what mm. they are used to really quickly because change is, is like, eh. So, the, you know, whatever, the, the red lenses or whatever, that they would, they would swing back to their proper worldview. Or the yeah. other equally possible thing in my mind would be that, that open personalities would just go, hey, cool, and go with it. So it, it yeah. would be interesting to see, you know, when, when, you know, should you ever be able to round up enough of a sample group to, to make it worth doing something like that? Yeah, it's a really interesting idea. I will say part of the reason I love studying vision science in particular is because I think personality psych and these other kinds of top-down psychologies are really difficult. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's hard to um, explain Mm -hmm. a lot of the variables that go into what helps someone develop those kind of executive function, personality, Mm -hmm. decision-making. I have so much respect for the people who study that, but it's uh, it's always confounded me because it's so many kind of things that you have to try to explain all at once. Mm -hmm. Um, That said, I will say a lot of the time when we do these studies, uh, we try our best to kind of trick people so that they're not using as much of their top-down influence, mm-hmm. um, especially with things like our lenses. We try our best to kind of put them in an environment where it's hard to um, it's hard to make a choice that's not just totally based on their perception. Mm-hmm. Um, it's obviously really hard to do that kind of thing, but um, especially with like the lenses, uh, like we were talking about, Uh, we try to put them in a position where they have to really rely on their senses and not on whatever kind of decision making process they're going through. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I definitely think there's a big gap in the research there trying to connect these things with like how you perceive things and, Mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, your personality and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I know that that's a big part of the internet likes to say, oh, are you right brained or left brain? That's how you see the dress. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think there's a lot of support for that kind of thing. So if you see that, you can mm-hmm. um, kind of say that's not yeah. really how it works. But I, there is <laughs> probably something going on to how people are perceiving the stress that's a little more complicated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
Well, yeah. well, one comment on that, just on the on the the sneaker, like the the shoe picture. Um, I tried to, I couldn't find any papers on it. Maybe they exist, and I just didn't search hard enough. But and I was trying to look. I was trying to find statistics on it. And the closest thing I could find was just an online poll on some news article, you know, from from back when it came out. And I mean, the the poll's been going for five years or something. But uh, but according to that poll, it was it was more of a, I think it was a three to one split. So like so like around seventy five percent, it was either two thirds or three fourths um, of people saw blue and gray, as mm-hmm. opposed as opposed to white and pink. Um, Interesting. so what, what I was thinking about that one is that in the, with the dress photo, it's even more, um, well, in the dress photo, it's easier to, to, well, in my mind, it's easier to create a context where the, where, um, I can, I can infer or, you know, hypothesize that the light source is, um, coming from the back or well it, it's easier to f- for me to figure out with my mind because there are the clues in the picture itself kind of but with the mm-hmm. with the shoe photo it's almost as if um it's in an environment with like a, a blue light on it mm-hmm. so so it's there's there's really only well from i'm one of the kind of blue gray people but but after after i after I learned about it, I was like, well, no, that, that actually really looks pink now. So, but now yeah. I, now I see it as blue and pink and as opposed to, <laughs> so I, I can't see, yeah. I can't see it as I white. Actually, but. Yeah. I think I had a similar percept where I, I think I saw it as blue and pink and that wasn't one of yeah. the options. And yeah. I thought, well, okay. <laughs> um, but I, d- I did find one paper that talks a little okay. bit about the shoe and the dress. Uh, but yeah, there's not as much work that's been done on the shoe yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think they showed something similar that it's not as much of an equal distribution between the two options. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also they did some kind of priming uh, experiments, kind of like okay. you talked about with the dress where yeah. they gave, they kind of blocked out certain parts of the picture to try to give people more context. And I think they blocked out with certain colors to try to prime what the lighting might be. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were able to kind of adjust what people saw, okay. if I remember correctly. Um, I can find that paper and send a link to it. Okay. But um, well, yeah, cool. I think similar to the dress, you can kind of change how people see it by giving them cues on t- as to what the lighting might be. Well, this might be a good segue into into some of you, the, the types of experiments and, and research mm-hmm. you do, because th- for me, that picture, it's, it's as if I'm looking at that picture through... Um, light blue lenses right so um maybe i know we've got i think we've got a couple stories about our experiences in this kind of well adam do you want to give do you want to give yours first and then yeah i'll just i'll I'll just give mine um so we were out back and uh we were doing some target practice and i had some safety goggles on and they had a light yellow tint um and we were out there for maybe like an hour something like that and we were walking back to the house and i completely forgot that i was wearing them um, and then all of a sudden I'm like, wait, why are these things on my face? And you were looking at your car, right? Which yeah. is white. Yeah. Which is white. And, uh, realized that I was still wearing them. I was like, oh, why am I wearing them? So I took them off and all of a sudden everything looked extremely blue. Um, like it, it was fine. Like I could, I knew that there was something not quite right when I was wearing the glasses, but then, but I couldn't really tell what it was. And then when I took them off, yeah, everything just seemed super blue, which was yeah, really weird. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, people experience that a lot too. Uh, swimmers can get that because uh, a lot of the time swim goggles have a little bit of a tint. Um, skiers experience a lot. Again, with a similar thing, they have a little bit of a yellowish tint usually in ski goggles. Um, and I think it's that, yeah, exactly. It's really fascinating um, how your brain can adjust to that kind of thing. Um, so we have an experiment going right now using uh, these kind of bright red lenses that are really intense. Um, and generally people don't completely notice that they're gone. They're a little, maybe too intense to completely adapt all the way. Mm. Um, which is a, kind of in itself really interesting to us because what are the limits of this yeah. adjustment that you mm-hmm. can make? Um, I, I published a paper a few years back using yellow lenses and people did kind of generally completely adapt away the yellow, like you described where you just couldn't really tell that anything was different anymore. Mm. 
Um, interesting though, for that paper, we didn't find that people had very much of an after effect. Um, so they didn't really see the world as being too blue. Um, we think it could be because they spent so much time in the dark room uh, doing measurements before they walked out into the world. So maybe it was just enough time to reset. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the after effect part, I think is still something a little bit mysterious to me uh, and how that after effect works and if it will could last as long as potentially it takes for you to make that adjustment in the first place. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of curious because it wasn't addressed in your paper and maybe it didn't even apply, but just as, just as a matter of curiosity, why is it that the adaptation, when, when you remove it for the after image, is a complementary color? Mm, that, you yeah. know, like, you, have you ever, I'm sure you've seen that one where it's an American flag, but it's actually green and black, uh, yeah. green and black stripes and, and orange for the wherever they needed blue. And I, I always kind of wondered, why, why is it just this very rigid correlation, it seems? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is another place I have slides <laughs> right. that we can talk about this. So uh, we could actually go to the first slide uh, this time. Oh, cool. Um, okay, is. so yeah. So um, as uh, maybe you all know, but sometimes people don't, uh, the way our color vision works is we have uh, three different types of color receptors in our eye. So we have all these things in our eye that can pick up light and they're, um, the color receptors are sensitive at different parts of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So in this graph, what you see along the bottom, you would that's essentially the rainbow. So starting at the lower end at about 400, that's gonna be pretty purpley. Um, and then up at the top around 700 is gonna be really reddish. Um, and you have these three different cones that are sensitive at different parts of that spectrum. Um, and then right next to that, what you see is uh, kind of a little simplified diagram of how our brain interprets what's coming from those cones. So essentially what's happening is your cones are combining, we call this uh, opponency. Um, so essentially for the blue yellow signal, your brain is looking for the difference between the short wavelength cones and then the combination of the uh, medium and long wave cones. So essentially what's the difference between the blue and the yellowish colors in the world? And then for red and green, your brain is looking at what's the difference between the middle wavelength and the long wavelength, which is essentially what's the difference between the greenish and the reddish colors. Oh. Okay. Um, and, and then uh, for lighting, for darkness or brightness, um, you see uh, the long minus the middle wavelength. So it's a pretty simple compare, or the long plus the middle wavelength. So just a magnitude of how much they're firing. Um, so this kind of makes up the dimensions of our color space. We kind of think of our color vision happening in three dimensions, which are roughly blue, yellow, red, green, and light and dark. Mm. Um, so if you actually could go maybe down to slide six. So uh, this part is a little bit of an animation that um, a friend of mine made named Sunny Lee. Okay. Um, but essentially how it works is um, you would have uh, your brain is seeing uh, white and that looks neutral. Then the magenta frog pops on and your brain correctly interprets the frog to be magenta. But over time, kind of like I explained, your brain starts to adjust to that magenta and it kind of starts to go away. So it's a similar mechanism to what you described when you were wearing your yellow lenses. After a while, you kind of stopped noticing that the yellow was even there. Um, so your brain has now shifted that entire red green mechanism so that the magenta looks more neutral. So then when I take away the magenta and what you see is a neutral white, um, it actually appears to be more green because your brain has started to adjust itself um, in such a way that you now have this green perception where it should just look neutral white, mm. if that kind of makes sense. And it's all based on this opponent way that your brain is encoding color. That just, it, that whole um, phenomenon just strikes me as completely crazy that, uh, that well, I don't, I don't know if it's just the way it's described um, because it's like, okay, to get this perception of a color, we're going to take these co these photoreceptors and we're going to take that signal and then we're going to subtract it from this one and we're going to add them together and then we're going to, it just seems like a, a crazy calculation to, to do just to 
perceive a color. Um, yeah. Am I, am I crazy for thinking that, or is? <laughs> no, I think it makes sense. But if you think about um, how else could you perceive so many different colors, mm -hmm. right? Because um, let's say, for example, you're an animal who has a bunch of different cone types. So we know these exist. So mantis shrimp have something like 25 to 40 different kinds of separate cones. Um, and some people think maybe they're doing some kind of insane multidimensional calculation to compare all of these different signals. Mm -hmm. But more likely what they're doing is they're just saying, okay, this one, this cone likes that color best. And so therefore that color is uh, red. That's my red cone. This is red. Okay. Um, but because we only have these three and that makes sense from an evolutionary perspective to give us really nice acuity uh you want kind of fewer cone types so that you can make direct comparisons across more of the same types if that makes sense hmm. you want a lot of these really tightly packed uh luminance sensitive cones the l and the m cones um so that you can make these judgments about luminance edges and brightness and darkness so you can do things like read text um and see fine details hmm. uh but therefore what that means is that we can't have 46 different cone types to tell us all these different colors okay so your brain can make do with what it has which is this just these three but just these three gives us this entire yeah. spectrum we can discriminate really, really fine, uh, really, really finely across the entire spectrum of visible light. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe uh, I, I want to hear your thoughts on this because one of the one of the crazy ideas I had when I was when I was thinking about cones. Well, actually, remind a after this, let's let's talk a bit about um, color blindness because you mentioned the red green in, in your in your description of the cones. So I want to get back to that. But first, on this subject of like let's say animals with a whole bunch of different um, types of cones. Um, so our our vision, our three receptors, three types of receptors, have a certain range. Like, what did you say? It was 400 to 700 something? Or? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. A little sub 400 and a little over 700. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, like, hypothetically, if we were to, to gain another two types of cones that would go into the infrared and ultraviolet regions, um, would you think that that vision, that our vision, that we'd actually see more colors, or do you think that the, the colors would be the, the the same spectrum of colors that we see would be distributed over just a wider range. Do you have any? What do you do? You have any thoughts on that? That's a great question. Okay. So I will say, um, our cones are positioned in a very nice location. So there are some animals that can see into the infrared, um, but they're generally cold blooded. So if we saw infrared, we would kind of be blinded by the heat of our own body, if that makes sense, because you're essentially ah. seeing heat. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> um, <laughs> Didn't even think about that. <laughs> yeah, and, and then on the other end, there are animals that can see ultraviolet. So uh, bees, uh, mice, I think, can see ultraviolet. There's a bunch of different hummingbirds can see ultraviolet. Um, but the thing is that it's a ultraviolet light is really damaging. Um, so our eyes are kind of built in this way that we filter out a lot of ultraviolet light. Mm -hmm. um, and that's to keep our cones safe so they're not damaged by the sun. Uh, so if we could see an ultraviolet light, um, our body might try to even just filter it out just so it doesn't actually damage the cones. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so or there's a reason. it wouldn't be for very long before right, it just exactly. got too damaged. Okay. Yeah, the animals that can see ultraviolet just tend to live shorter lives so yeah. they don't have mm -hmm. to deal with the long-term repercussions of that. Um, so, yeah, so there's a reason why we sit in that particular okay. range and why a lot of animals sit in that particular range. Um, and then to your second question, if we added more cones, so there are some people that have an extra cone. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a little, this is pretty interesting. Um, uh, there, the way you get some colorblind people is uh, there's something called anomalous trichromacy, which is where you have three types of cones. Um, but two of them are just slight genetic variations of each other. Mm. So I showed you an L, an M, and an S cone. Um, but let's say, for example, you only had L cones and S cones. Um, but then some people have L cones and then like a slightly off L cone. Mm. Um, so it, we call this sometimes an L and an L prime. Um, and th those two L cones are both just normal variations of L cones that live in the population, but this person just so happened to get one type of L cone from their mom and one type of L cone from their dad. So now they have color blindness because they don't have that middle sensitive cone, but they can see some 
red green because they have a little bit of difference between their L and their L prime cone. Mm. Does that kind of make sense? So mm -hmm. um, that anomalous trichromacy is actually the most common type of color blindness. If you okay. know somebody who's colorblind, they probably have anomalous trichromacy. Um, so the way you get a person with four cone types is actually women or people with two X chromosomes um, can have both of those genetic variations. So they could potentially have an L, an L prime, an M, and an S, okay. or they could have, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we call those people tetrachromats. Um, it's rare and it's controversial <laughs> because it's not clear that the people who are tetrachromats can actually use that fourth cone. Um, there are some people who have been genetically confirmed that they're tetrachromats and they do seem to perform slightly differently on very specific tasks. And so we think that they maybe are using their fourth cone. Um, what it looks like, we're not sure of. Um, and also what they might be using it for, we're a little unclear on too, because it might just be that they're better at discriminating reds. Than I other read, people. I read an article about tetrachromats, and uh, and this is strictly self-reporting, so you know. But apparently, it was it was her assertion that she was able to see much finer gradations of yes, so, hue and tone, and 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 of course, be, she had no idea that nobody else could. So she would be arguing with somebody over three three shades of peach, which to her were like completely distinct colors. Mm -hmm. And and somebody else would be going, uh, they're all peach. So, you know, right. but it is a yeah. self-report. So what do you do? You know. Well, um, so yeah, uh, probably the person you're talking about. There's a, there's an artist in Southern California who works with somebody a lot at UC Irvine, um, and she uh, paints these kind of surrealist paintings that have a lot of color. Um, they're they're really beautiful, um, and I think she's a fascinating person because she does have now this combination of yes, she does actually have genetically better color vision than the other people, mm -hmm. and she has all this training because she's an artist that she can discriminate colors mm -hmm. generally better. So artists get better just because they're they're doing that all the time, mm -hmm. discriminating colors. Um, so it's a little bit of a confound because uh, she already has that training that she's so good at it uh, but yes i think there are tests that show that she is genetically better at color vision mm -hmm. than other people though yeah it's like it's one of those questions of if i put my brain into your head would it really look any different to me mm -hmm. it's it's unclear yeah. but she definitely has a little bit of a superpower i would say yeah well one thing we wanted to ask about um is on the subject of color blindness is you know there are those glasses that have been developed that uh, that that are supposed to I don't know much about them they're supposed to help um, you know color people with color blindness to be able to to perceive those differences in color um, how does that work yeah, <laughs> yeah. so there's a few different variations of this so um, if you want to cheat a color test uh, there are a few ways you can actually do it one of them is uh, any kind of um, colored lens could actually help you be cheat a color test. Mm. Um, and that's because color tests are designed specifically with the spectral properties of colorblind people in mind. Yeah. And so if you put on any kind of color filter, you're going to shift the entire space in such a way that now the color test is not actually testing on that dimension that you're really bad at. Yeah. Mm -hmm if that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, these specific lenses though, that you're I think you're talking about are in chroma lenses is yeah. the brand name. Um, and they're interesting because they have a, what's called a notch filter. So if you look at say um, the light that comes in through just a pair of sunglasses, you're gonna see all the same light in, on a spectrum, um, but it's just decreased by a little bit. Um, but their lenses specifically are filtering out light at certain parts of the spectrum. Okay. So they have, they're essentially just filtering the blue and the yellow part of the spectrum so that the people who are wearing the glasses see a lot more red green in comparison to the blue yellow. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And so what that does is it makes that in the same way we were just talking about context, the red green now appears to be much more enhanced. Mm. Um, and that again, this would only really work for people with that anomalous trichromacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're a dichromat, there's nothing really there to enhance mm -hmm. dichromacy, meaning you just have the two kinds of cones. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, uh, that's the way that these okay. work. Um, 
there's a recent study that came out in current biology um, that showed that wearing them actually could help you long term kind of learn to see these colors better. Um, it's a like, little controversial, like a form of brain training, like, exactly. like you're, you're, you're messing with the wiring now. Right. Um, and it, in it kind of like I was saying, the artist who got really good at discriminating colors mm -hmm. um, in a similar way, these people maybe could have been training themselves to see red and green more their whole lives, but maybe they're not doing that until they get these glasses. And now yeah. these colors are really obvious and apparent. So now they get better at it over time. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Oh, go ahead. I yeah. just had another question. But, <laughs> oh, yeah. But uh, I guess I was going to say it's a little controversial because you might actually predict an opposite effect. So if you are exposing yourself to a lot of this red and green um, in the same way that you were exposing yourself to a lot of red with the red glasses, that color, those colors might start to fade over time. Mm -hmm. um, and so then when you're not wearing the glasses anymore, you might see less red and green. Um, Actually, that was exactly my question. My, my yeah. question was, if you were to, for some awful reason, long term, would you, in essence, decommission the cones or the you know the rods or the the, the wavelength like I, I was sort of thinking of this analogy when when you have too much dopamine or too much whatever you actually down regulate your receptors so if you're overloading one aspect of your of your light perception mechanism say the red cones will they wear out shut down quit working i mean is that you know can you attenuate their function um, that's a great question. And yeah, I would have expected, I was really shocked when I saw those results because I would have expected what you said where maybe you actually get worse at red green when you're not wearing them. Mm -hmm. Um, but the study, I mean, the data are the data. So you, uh, they showed that people did seem to improve when they're not wearing, they were being tested without the glasses. And I think they tested people for 11 days and people within the first three days showed this improvement and that improvement remained pretty stable across the entire rest of the session with a lot of variability um and people who have studied anomalous trichromats know that they're an even a very mm -hmm. uh heterogeneous population uh, both genetically and behaviorally um but so. I'm, talk I'm talking about a normal sighted person like somebody mm. you would have wrote, wrote you know rounded up for your study um yeah. would is I'm not saying there's a potential for damage, but but I mean, is is that something you would expect when you sort of take one or well, I don't know, are you overloading with input with red glasses or are you right. just sort of subtracting that out? I was just curious, you know, I don't know yeah, if animal no. studies are possible or what. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. And the the short answer is we're pretty sure that it's not gonna permanently change anything just because your cones actually are kind of always shedding um, pigments really quickly uh, or the, the the part that's responsible for absorbing light um, so in the short term no we wouldn't expect your any kind of physical damage to your actual cones mm -hmm. um, but like we've talked about your brain is so involved in all of these processes so whether or not your brain is now doing some kind of tricky thing to mm -hmm. permanently change how you see red mm -hmm. um we can't really know i will mm -hmm. say one thing that we're working on right now in our lab with these red lenses is um can your brain kind of switch modes when you put these glasses on and off oh. so kind of like when you get a new pair of glasses they cause kind of a headache for a little while and your your optometrist will tell you you just have to get used to them mm -hmm. um, but what you might notice then is after a week when you put them on in the morning you don't have to get used to them all over again right, right? so now you've spent a period of time without them you put them back on mm -hmm. your brain just instantly is okay with it um, and so we've been wondering with these red glasses could we simulate something like that mm -hmm. could you put on these red glasses and kind of jump back to where you left off in your adaptation state um, and we have some promising evidence to show that that's kind of what happens is that when you have the context of feeling the frames on your face seeing the red all of that combined can kind of allow your brain to develop these different visual modes mm -hmm. that you can might be able to switch back and forth mm -hmm. um, and i'm working with a grad student named yen jin lee who uh, put out a paper about this uh, and can send you that soon um cool. yeah well that <clears throat> well something you just said and then something you said uh, that previously just reminded me of a paragraph 
under the the natural experiment setting in your paper. Um, maybe I'll just I'll read the whole thing because I don't don't trust myself not to leave out something important. So, natural experiments provide additional evidence of long-lasting adaptation to changes in scene color. So this is this is what made me think of it is because we're talking about like wearing these glasses and it having almost like a permanent effect, right? So I guess the closest the closest thing in the research would be long-term adaptation. Um, mm -hmm. you know, in relation to that. So as people age, the lens of the eye yellows, shifting the spectrum of the light reaching the retina. Neutral settings in older observers do not show a corresponding shift, however, indicating that the long term that long term adaptation occurs. When the yellowed lens is replaced as treatment for cataract surgery, the long term adaptation is evident as a negative after effect. Because the more yellow scene has become neutral, the unfiltered world appears bluish. Remarkably, you know, this is the part that um, I was thinking of. This after effect takes months to fade. Mm -hmm. So this would be after like um, after years of you know your vision years getting of, yeah of very slowly gradual. adjusting yeah. mm -hmm. exactly. So mm -hmm. then you suddenly take away that yellow um, and everything looks really blue. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, it does. It takes uh, I think months for a lot of those cataract patients to return back to the setting that they had before the lens was removed, which is really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, but that, that would make me think that, um, well, I'd think there wouldn't be any kind of like long-term danger of, of totally adapting your vision to something else and then not being able to fix it. Right. Because, um, yeah. cause I'm reminded of a couple things. One is the experiment, um, that they've been doing for, I think like over a hundred years of inverting your vision using, um, like prisms or, or mirrors. So essentially, I learned about this in, in you know, psychology and university, but basically create some goggles that flip your world upside down. So when you look through the goggles, the world is, you know, actually upside down. And you, so in these experiments, these guys will, will wear them for days and days and days or weeks. And what they find is, there's some videos on YouTube you can find if you search for them, but, they, they, you know, they're, they're spill, <laughs> spilling their tea and they, they can't do anything and they're trying to ride bikes mm -hmm. and they're falling all over the place because literally your, the, your, your arm is moving in the op opposite direction you think it is. Yeah. But then a after time, you get, they get used to it to the point where, they, where they're totally adapted to it. They can ride their bike, they can pour their tea, they can go about their lives totally ordinarily. Then after that, they take the goggles off for the first time, and all of a sudden, boom, they're, they're back in this upside-down world, even though they're not wearing the goggles anymore. But it takes less time to adapt back to, to, um, to normal. So there's, mm -hmm. like, the, the two things that strike me as very interesting about that are, first of all, that you adapt in the first place, but it's not that strange considering that apparently that's, we, we all do that as babies because, um, apparent, well, because our vision is upside-down and our, our, our mind makes sense of it by by aligning it, you know, with the movements we actually make so that everything makes sense. But still it's weird. And then the mm -hmm. the second thing that's that that is interesting is um that um well that one I'm just still marveling over that first one, but <laughs> this the second one I think is is that adapt adaptation time. That there mm -hmm. is a, a like a, a pretty much a permanent adaptation while you're wearing it. And then there then afterwards it, it's almost um, I guess no one's done an experiment where they've done it for like years at a time because that would be right. quite awkward. But um, but I wonder if if well well do you have any thoughts about that? Would, would is what's the relation to adapt like the the adaptation time? You know, it takes a long time to right. adapt the first time and then it's short afterwards. Well, going back to normal. Right. I mean, so um, it's a little complicated, I think. Right. Um, so when we know that there are kind of these like critical periods of development, right? So as you're, when you're really young, um, your brain is kind of wiring all these different ways. And so, for example, um, people have done studies where they rear kittens in worlds that don't have um, horizontal edges. And then for the rest of their lives, those kittens are, aren't able to see those horizontal edges because their brains never really were able to make those connections. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, there are people who lost their sight when they were incredibly young. And then as they got older, some new medical treatment came along and they were able to gain their sight back. But there were certain things that they were never able to redevelop. So um, we there's something called face blindness or prospagnosia. Um, and so a lot of, all of them have this prospagnosia because uh, you can't really learn to recognize faces as well once you're an adult. Um, 
but the lines of, of this these so-called critical periods are a little blurry because it does seem like there are some things that you can develop when you're a little older. Some of those things are in the visual system. Um, and there are also people who say have a stroke or um, some other kind of brain damage as an adult, but then they kind of are able to recover some of that function uh, in theory by recruiting other brain areas to take mm -hmm. over that function. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit of why I study what I study, because a lot of the time people think of the visual system as being really hardwired from the time you're really young. Um, but we know that you can adjust in these different ways. You can learn to these different modes of being. Mm -hmm. um, but what are the limits of that? What are the limits of how much your brain can readjust over relatively short periods of yeah. time? Um, well, I do. I have an adjustment story. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, about 10 years ago, I had an episode of central serous chorioretinopathy, which is, uh, oh, you know what that is. Yay. <laughs> I, I know retinopathy. I know okay. the last part a little okay. bit. Okay. <laughs> what, it, what it means is, is that uh, behind the retina and mercifully not in front, directly in front of the optical nerve, the, uh, the different layers separated and they started to fill with fluid. And okay. didn't even know this. Uh, but the net effect is like having a, a, a sunglass lens at the back of your eye. Hmm. And it was, it was kind of accidental that I even noticed it. I was just playing with my vision, cover one eye, cover the other eye, and I noticed it was this big, circular, dark area, you know. Interesting. And then I got on the internet and scared myself to death, and <laughs> oh my god, macular degeneration, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. so, so I off to the ophthalmologist. <laughs> And uh, apparently it's not uncommon, but it can be a vision problem because the more fluid, the less light reception you get. So like I said, it was like having a sunglass. Um, it is treatable. I ended up having uh, a laser surgery to kind of cauterize the point of the leak. And then the eye reabsorbed, I would say, maybe 95% of the fluid. However, there was a permanent distortion in the mm. back of the eye. So... If I only look through that one eye, uh, verticals aren't vertical. They're kind of curved. Uh, there is a little less light coming in. So my perception, if I'm only looking through that one eye, is it's not as bright. However, with two eyes, I can't tell. It's like somewhere in the back of the brain, it takes both, uh, you know, both inputs and mixes it into something that looks perfectly normal. And that just astounds me just about yeah. every day that, that, that there is so, you know, if I hadn't been actually playing around, you know, just like, oh, one eye or the other, I never, I never would have noticed because the perceptual mixing was being done so well that who knew, you know? Oh. So, yeah. Um, and we all actually have an example of this. So do you know about the blind spot? So, um, yeah, you actually are completely lacking photoreceptors, right, where um, all the path goes back into your optic nerve. And so anybody can kind of see it if you cover an eye and uh, move your thumb at about arm's length away, you might see the tip of your thumb disappear for a second. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an example we were talking about. We call it filling in where um, your other eye is now compensating for that little mm -hmm. lack of vision in that one part of your eye. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's that's really interesting. So, are you good now? Like, do you, yeah, <laughs> do they I mean, think it could? Uh, it's as good as it's going to get. Um, like for a while, it was down like twenty seventy. It was which is terrible because I used to have really good eyes. But um, the the amount of light coming in is is as good as it's going to get. In fact, I, I test it with uh, certain stars. If I can see mm -hmm. certain stars, I know that I'm. It's it's really good. And if I'm starting to have trouble, it's, it's, it's actually an interesting barometer of stress. Hmm. Like, like if, it, if it starts to get a little, little more dim, then I know I need to like back off and you know, settle down. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Hmm. But, yeah. I, I, but okay, so the work you're doing is you're staying at the, the mechanical side. of. I don't, want, I don't want to use the word mechanical, but, but at the, the word sort of the start of the whole chain of perception you're looking at a little bit yeah i mean i will say there are people who are a little bit lower level than me who study mm -hmm. mostly in the eye um and the retina mm -hmm. uh and i'm a little bit i'm at least in the 
the early part of the brain <laughs> where the, the, the input is first coming in, uh -huh. um, but not much beyond that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's about where I sit in the hierarchy of people who study psychology. It's like so, mm, close to the bottom. So in, in the brain are so are are you at the are you at the part in the brain where the Photoshop editors are that are doing all this stuff, you know, to, to uh, <laughs> where's the Photoshop editor? That's I mean it's hard to say. So um yeah, well we were talking about context effects. Probably a lot of those happen pretty early. Um a lot of them happen probably in early visual cortex. We call it V1. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are certain parts of our color perception that we think happen a little bit higher. So probably part of the reason you were so surprised when I talked about these opponent mechanisms is because that's not really the way we think about color normally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't. Yeah. Uh, if I said, what's the opposite of red, you might say green, but it also might not be that intuitive to even think about colors having opposites. Mm -hmm. Um and especially if I go kind of off kilter, like what's the opposite of orange? Uh, somebody with art training might kind of get close to it, but it's it's still hard to think about. Um, we generally kind of think of colors as these kind of straight discrete categories. So you have these kind of different bunches of colors that are red, green, turquoise, um, orange, whatever you may have it. Um, and that happens a little higher up in the brain um well, probably more close to how we think about objects and and language and things like that mm -hmm. um yeah so that's a little bit intermixed with what i think about as well well speaking of orange do we, have, we haven't talked about orange yet have we just no. just really quick um this is this is one thing i wanted to well I, I should have mentioned it early on when we were talking about um um just kind of the basic visual like illusions and things like that. Um, I'll I'll give a link in the show description to a video by what's the guy's channel? Uh, Technology Connections. He did this video on brown, and uh, the conclusion which blew my mind was that brown is really just dark orange. Um, which, like I said, blew blew my mind when I when I saw this. And I'm not the only one. I can I can proudly say there, I'm not the only one. There was much yelling in the room. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we. <laughs> there, there actually was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, well, let, let's let's put up a slide. Um, one of the screenshots. Okay, so what color? What color is that? That looks like brown, brown to me. <laughs> okay, now this may may not work. We might have, we not, might have to fix it in post production. But now let's go to the other one. Oh. Yeah, we're gonna do that in post production because it looks the same to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think that was something. I think that was something that he was talking about. That yeah. The, it really because we have all of the extra context that it's not going to give it mm -hmm. the the stark contrast that it needs in order to right. really. Because uh, we, we did it real. right. We turned the lights off. We did the whole thing, and on a, on a big it TV. was but, oh yeah. But basically, so so what we just saw <laughs> was it, it, the the context, like the the light. The, the relative lightness of the, the scene, which is you know, essentially just a, a black or white background, will affect how we perceive the, the square in the center. And there, there are all kinds of reasons for that. Like he goes through, he, he has a very, um, um, a very handy way of doing it. He uses the, the color, what's it called when you put the, the, the hue circle or something, where you have, uh, you, there's a triangle in the middle with hue, brightness, and saturation. And so basically you can, uh, you can, you basically you I think you lighten the you're basically in in the in the orange section of the spectrum and then you basically go what head down towards he black head down towards black so you've got a dark orange mm -hmm. and it, when you're looking at the triangle that's showing all the all the shades of of orange you know it looks like okay black and then there, there are all these shades of orange and there's a dark orange but then when you click on it and you choose that color and you start drawing with it it's it's brown so it's mm -hmm. one of those one of those just kind of automatic strange things about about color perception um and his point was that um aside from the fact that brown is his favorite color that uh really it's just um that's just a shade of orange that we've come up with a name for well one one reason but um do you have any strong opinions one way or the other on orange and brown? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think the orange brown stuff is very cool. Uh, so a lot of this work has been done by a guy named uh, Stephen Buck, who's at the University of Washington 
and Mady retired now. Um, and his grad students who worked on this are Tanner DeLoyer and yours, Vincent, I think did most of it. Okay. Um, but it's very cool. So it's uh, brown is what they call a context color, meaning yeah. you need to have um, some amount of contrast in order to see it at all. Um, so kind of like people will probably see with the demo, um, if you just see brown on black with no context of anything brighter, it'll still look kind of orangey or honeycomb, I think is something, I think he, when he was doing these experiments, he would ask people to draw the honeycomb line, which is mm. like where that border between orange and brown or yellow and brown kind of sits. Um, yeah, I think it's really great. And there's a lot of, uh, I can try to find some, but there's a few different illusions that then can interact with oh. brown and yellow. So um, different context illusions that work with lightness and brightness then will also work with brown and yellow, which is really cool. Oh, mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, speaking of yellow, uh, if we move on from brown, unless anyone else had any thoughts on brown. Okay, speaking of yellow, um, I want to talk a bit about the, a bit more about the actual experiments that, uh, that you do and that you talk about in this paper because the, the thing that blows my mind the most about this kind of research is um, Adam gave his story of you know his adaptation wearing these lightly tinted yellow lenses and and I've got I've got another similar story not to do with lenses that I'll tell but the the thing that really blows my mind is the fact that you can be looking at um, an object you know through a colored lens so I'd say objectively you know, whatever that means, there is a certain wavelength of light, a certain color that, that you should be perceiving. But mm -hmm. you, but the, the, what, the way the adaptation actually works is that the, the range of that color will actually change. So, so you will see, you will start seeing essentially what might be a yellow tinted white as white. So you're right. not actually seeing the yellow anymore, which blows my mind. But but before before I ask the question, I want to I want to talk about this uh, software that I use, Flux. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it's one of those computer programs that uh, takes out the blue as the it, with the, um, as the sun goes down, it takes out the blue light in your monitor to kind of um, mm. you know relax your your brain so you're not getting blue light in the evening. Same with like blue blocker lenses, but yeah. it's just a screen version. So I it I it I've been using it for years, so it goes on automatically, you know, as the sun goes down. To the point where um, sometimes I can realize it's on just because I know it's on, but when it's most of the time when it's on, I don't realize that it's it's on. And when you turn it off, then all of a sudden, you know, it's like you stepping into a new like bright room where everything's you know a lot brighter. But when I'm looking at it, same with Adam, right? I can't tell it's on, and I'll, I'll be able to say, okay, that's white, even though I'm pretty sure it's not white. But mm -hmm. but the thing about that is that. Because it is taking out the blue, sometimes I might be watching a video where I know there should be something blue there, um, but I can't see it. And it's, o it's only after a while that I realize, okay, wait a second, why can't I see the blue thing? Well, it's, it's because there's, I haven't been seeing blue for hours. There's, there's no yeah. blue that's actually there. But one of the questions that you ask in the paper about um, color adaptation is, does the world seen through colored glasses ever appear completely normal? And then you talk a bit about uh, the difference between like weaker lenses and stronger lenses. So this is what I wanted to, to get into because on the one hand, it seems like, let's say with a, weak, a weaker lens, it seems like you should be able to adjust and see all the colors. But in the example of, let's say, looking at something under like a monochromatic light, mm -hmm. like let's say you just, you get thrown into, into an environment where you're, you've just got this one light color and um, like, I don't know if... if if viewers have seen pic, um, videos or pictures of it, you know you might look, be looking at a Rubik's cube, and you you put it under monochromatic light, and then all of a sudden you can't see the difference between all these squares. They just kind of look all the same, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, as maybe that can be a launching off point for like what what kind of adaptations we actually see, and then what you think the limits of that might be. Like, are there are there ways that that you absolutely wouldn't be able to adapt to, like in a monochromatic light environment, would you be able to to see a certain color that just seems to to not be there when you're looking at it? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It's something I've struggled with a little bit with the the really bright red lenses we're using now, because after wearing them for 
a few days, uh, or even if you just wear them for a few hours at a time, things definitely look green, but I don't know for sure that I'm actually getting anything into my eye that is green, if that makes sense. Mm. But I definitely can tell when something is green um, because green through the red lenses is physically very gray. So it's essentially a neutral to my cones, Um, but it looks really green maybe because I've just learned that that's what green is. Mm. Um, So that's a great question. And again, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about with people who have very yellow lenses when they are older. they probably aren't seeing blue and haven't actually seen blue for a long time. Um, A lot of that is just completely cut off, Um, but yet they're still seeing blue. They still know when things are blue because they've just kind of learned statistically what blue should look like. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's a guy named uh, Carl Gegenfurtner who has done a lot of work um, on something called color memory, um, which is essentially when you see something that has a very strong color association and it looks like it has color even when it doesn't. So he does these experiments where he shows people uh, a Mm. banana and he asks them to make the banana gray by adding different colors to it. So it'll start off as a a really blue banana and they have to add yellow until it looks neutral. Um, And what he's found is that people have to add too much blue because they're seeing the banana as just a little bit yellow. And he's kind of repeated this with several different objects that have these really strong color associations. And you can experience this in real life. A lot of science museums and things have um, sodium lamp rooms and sodium lamps are, um, they only have a very narrow band of light that they project. So everything is technically monochromatic. Mm. They can only really give you different shades of this kind of orangey color. Um, That's the only light that they Um, emit so that's the only light that your eye can reflect that you can pick up Um, but when you go into these rooms sometimes they'll have something like a pepsi can that has a very strong color association Mm -hmm. and you can it looks blue it looks like a blue can even though it's physically not there's Mm. you cannot see blue there Um, and sometimes people even take it a step further and they'll paint the pepsi can green and it'll still look blue and then you take it outside it's actually a green can um So there are these things where our brain has really learned what colors are, learned about the distribution of colors in our world. And so it's really hard to disentangle what is actually real sometimes in terms of color and what is actually being interpreted by our brain. Mm -hmm. That was uh, what was trying, like, I had some of the similar thoughts that you were having uh, when you were trying to come at the question of, Um, you know, like what's happening at that level. Uh, and it's just, it's like the, the, the mind or the brain knows on some level what this is supposed to look like. And it, and so it's giving you an interpretation of the thing based on a memory where Mm -hmm. it's like, it knows what you consciously see without you consciously telling it what you're seeing, which I think is just kind of like. But it's busy uh, photoshopping it so you're happy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, another you, anybody can experience this too. Um, so at a certain light level, uh, those cone photoreceptors aren't sensitive enough to pick up any light. Um, and so we have this other set of photoreceptors called rods that are responsible for night vision. Um, so during the day, they're inactive because everything is too bright. So they just max out and they essentially, we call them bleached and they can't do anything. But um, when you go to bed and you turn off all your lights, uh, you only have rods and rods are colorblind. They're just one singular unit that they're all sensitive to the same wavelengths so they can't make any comparisons. So everyone is colorblind at a certain light level, but almost no one's aware of it. (laughs) Um, So that's something you can try out. Turn off all the lights. Um, and just have maybe like a tiny little light source, like a, a really dim candle or something. And um, in theory, you're colorblind in in that condition, but you might still think that you can see colors. Wow. <laughs> it was actually, so I was talking about the sodium lamps. Now they're really pretty rare and you can mostly only find them in these science museums and things like that. But they used to be used for street lights. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a big problem for this reason because people who witnessed something or uh, were like looking for somebody, uh, 
perceived colors, illusory colors under these lights um, when there weren't any. And so they would be like, I'm pretty sure it was a red car. Well, you have no idea what the color of the car was because you literally couldn't see it. (laughs) But um, yeah, so there's, they now no longer have sodium lights as street lights. I wonder how long it took them to figure that out. That, I mean, that, that from a witness point of view, that it, it would be a problem. Um, right. You said something really interesting, and I just sort of wanted to fly back to it for just a second. At, the eye seems to be very, very efficient at maintaining itself. I mean, I knew a cornea replaces itself every three days, but the rods do too. I mean, all the cones are constantly bringing themselves. Mm-hmm, yeah. Wow. Yeah. You essentially have these discs that are absorbing the light and they're kind of constantly shedding and, um, and replacing themselves because they, they kind of, yeah, they have to, in order to keep absorbing new photons. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. Maybe I want to bring up one of the diagrams, one of the figures from the paper. Um, Adam, can you go to figure two? This is, I'll read the description of it. So this is a sample. This is a sample of long-term adaptation effects. Data are plotted from an observer. After donning red glasses, unique yellow shifted towards redder, redder color coordinates and slowly returned to its prior values after the glasses were removed. Okay, so we've got the picture up there. Could you maybe just walk us through this and explain what this experiment is and what we're seeing on this graph? Sure. Um, So I've talked, I guess, a little bit about um, how we make these measurements, but uh, really what people do is they essentially show you something and they ask you to make some kind of judgment about it. Mm -hmm. So in this situation, what they were doing is they were showing people a light, a very narrow bandwidth of light. In this case, it's kind of in the yellowish range. Um, And they were asking people to adjust it until it appeared to have nothing but yellow. So no red, no green. It was just the purest yellow. And this is a really nice judgment to make because in theory that yellow is a little bit special because it kind of is where your L and your M cones might be kind of neutralized. Um, It's a little bit of a debate, but that's kind of the idea behind making this kind of judgment is that you can make an, you can adjust a color until it looks pure yellow to you. So what that means is because that yellow is based on the combination of those L and M cones, if I show, if I give you these red glasses, um, the red glasses are going to be specifically affecting only the L cones. And so when you wear these red glasses, now your L cones are adjusting to that red and kind of eliminating it. They're, they're getting exhausted by the red um, and they're starting to kind of uh, tone down their signal a little bit because of that red. Mm-hmm. So then what that means is now when you take off the lenses and you make this kind of judgment, uh, everything looks a little too green. So you have to add more red back in, in order to um, compensate for that adaptation that you just went through. So essentially what this is showing is the way that setting changes over time. So when they, before they put on the glasses, um, their yellow point is sitting uh, I can, between like, like 576 and 578. Yep. Um, and then when they're wearing the glasses, now uh, they have to add a lot more uh, red in order to cancel out, in order to compensate for those mm-hmm. exhausted red cones that have just right. been doing too much for so long. Um, and so you get this shift that lasts for uh, a while. And then when you stop wearing the red cones, you get this kind of shift slow shift the red glasses you get this kind of slow shift back to neutral Mm -hmm. so so basically you're wearing these glasses and then you put them on and well throughout this whole thing so all those points all those data points on this on this graph are basically this is what yellow looks like so Mm -hmm. so yellow what so the exact same perceived color perceived shade of yellow is actually appearing now in different frequencies, um, like exactly. difference of like what, like six six nanometers. Is that what that's what NM means, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's what NM means, yeah. And then, and then for like ten days afterwards, it takes ten days for that normal yellow to actually get back the perception of yellow to get back to where it should be. So mm-hmm. this is the crazy thing: is that this whole time you're seeing the same shade of yellow, but but what you're actually looking at is a different frequency of light, you know, this whole time. So yeah, 
That's exactly. And this is kind of what we were talking about a little bit um, when we're trying to fool people, because the important part about this study is that they go into a dark room and all they can see is that light. Mm-hmm. Um, so if they had the chance to see everything else in the room, they might be able to kind of figure out that everything statistically is different. Mm-hmm. Everything looks a little bit too green because these the alcones are kind of tamped down. So if we ask them to make this judgment in a fully lit room, um, they might actually give us the exact same answer as they did before they wore the lenses. But because we're doing this, they they did this in a dark room where all you can see is this little light um, coming out of this machine. Uh, now you can actually see how the cones are changing over mm-hmm. time in the data. Mm-hmm. Well, wouldn't that wouldn't that also apply? Um, like, so let's say you're you're wearing tinted glasses and you're wearing them for for weeks, and you so if you're looking at like an apple or or Coca Cola can, it should be a particular shade of red or whatever any object any different color. Um, what am I trying to say? You would it, it would change in the same way, wouldn't it? Like what, wouldn't wouldn't everything change? Like you're basically you are perceiving things on a on a, a range of frequencies that is shifted from all those like all of those frequencies are shifted from what they should be in, you know, without those glasses. Right. So it's actually, right. it, it, it's basically like a, a translation. So it's like, here's where it should be. Here's where it is now. And, and your perception actually shifts to, to seeing different frequencies, a different set of frequencies, a different range of frequencies as the, the, the previous set, which yeah. is mm-hmm. totally different. Yeah. Which is crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, like an, it's like an Overton window. You just yeah. moved everything. How many nanometers, one way or uh-huh. the other. Mm-hmm. And be, and if you're looking at it contextually, that's where you stop saying, oh, how strange, because right. everything is moved yeah. together. And uh, this is a little, again, well, controversial, but potentially um, you're kind of adapting to the green world now because everything's too green. And so now your brain is adjusting to that green lens. Mm-hmm. Um, how does that work? <laughs> like that's... Mm-hmm. That's uh, that's where I'm at. <laughs> how do, how do you adjust to the after effect too? Mm-hmm. It's a good question. Um, well, I think it's a great question. Well, one other really cool thing I didn't I didn't even think about was in the same section on natural experiments where you talk about um, the the basically natural environments that will affect your adaptation. For example, just living in a green, you know, in the summer. When, when there's all, all kinds of green, that will actually affect your color perception. You'll, you'll, mm-hmm. your, your vision will, will compensate for that extra amount of green in your, in your visual field, which, mm-hmm. which is also very cool. Is there anything? Yeah. Anything oh, well, I mean, like people, yeah. people might have experienced this already if you move to a new region. So I uh, went to grad school in Reno, Nevada, which is very deserty and brown. Mm-hmm. And then I moved to Minnesota in the Midwest and I got here in the summer and it was like, wow, this is so much green. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but after a period of time, it kind of went back to normal. And the same thing happened when I was in Reno. I didn't, I obviously I knew it was a brown and I was aware of the lack of color, but um, I didn't think of it as that unusual after being there for mm-hmm. a while. Mm-hmm. So uh, those long-term effects uh, you can really experience if you think about it when you move to a new location yeah. or when the seasons change or anything like that. Well, I went the other way. I went from upstate New York, like trees forever, to Nevada, southern Nevada. And I mm. remember getting off the plane and it was just brown everywhere. Right. <laughs> and it, it took, I <laughs> know, it's like just brown. And it took a long time before you could start to see the gradations, the color, the foliage, plants. And stuff. Yeah. But yeah. It, yeah, it was qu- quite a shock. So you wonder, um, it would be interesting to do work perhaps with, you know, Inuit people, so much white. You know? mm-hmm. yeah, um, yeah, my, my, yeah, my graduate advisor um, used to spend a lot of time in India, which is uh, like it's a very colorful culture in general, but also they have these huge changes in color across seasons because they where mm-hmm. he was at in India, they had kind of a rainy season and an arid season. Um, and so he used to do some color naming experience experiments with the people who lived there. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I, there's that would be 
a really fun thing to do. It's just like, I'm just going to go <laughs> to this country and, and figure out how people are seeing colors there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Katie, did you have anything? Uh, did you want to show us any more of your slides? Um, was there anything else that was in there? So um, what you might find fun is the lilac chaser illusion. I like that one a lot. Yeah. If you if you stare at the cross in the center, um, you'll start to notice that uh, oh, you yep. see a green oh. circle going around. Oh. Um, oh so the God. green circle is actually not there, right? The green circle is an after effect. Um, and then the other cool thing is if you stare at it for even longer, all the purple mm -hmm. disappears. Yep, yes. it's like Pac-Man. Um, it just went... Oh my lord. And so then is... all you're left with is this green and the green is not real, which I think is fantastic. Oh my god. <laughs> and it's the only um, color. Oh, that is bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's so, like green uh, Pac-Man eating <laughs> eating these pink dots. <laughs> and, right. And then, they, and they then they're all gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I like this one a lot because um I think it kind of demonstrates why adaptation is so important and why I, I love it so much is because what our visual system really kind of needs to care about in any given moment is what's changing in a scene. So everything that's very stable is not really important to you. Um, you don't need to perform any kind of actions on it immediately, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so um, something that your visual system does is uh, called fading, which is where you can have these things. It mostly happens out in the periphery where um, you have what are called bigger receptive fields. Um, so you can kind of pool information in bigger areas together. Um, and so uh, you see these things kind of disappear right in front of you. Um, I think this is especially cool. There are some animals that have stabilized eyes, so they don't have eye movements. They only mm. move by moving their heads I like Batman. and potentially, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> owls. Um, <laughs> owls, yeah. But pot potentially some people think the reason why that might be is so that they can sit very still and have the entire world just fade away and only see something as mm. it moves, mm -hmm. which might be a very efficient way to be a predator. Um, so that's mm. uh, the lilac chaser illusion. Yeah, that is crazy. <laughs> I, I have not seen that one before and it, it's yeah. mind blowing. Um, and then the next one is not a video, the Spanish okay. castle illusion. So this is just another fun one that I like a lot. It's a um, another color after image. So this time again, you just want to stare at the dot um, for a little bit. And essentially um, this is a, a negative after, uh, this is a negative image of the original. So now when we go to the next slide, um, this is actually a black and white image. Oh, wow. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> And it just faded. Oh, wow. Man. Yeah. So you kind of have to like blink, maybe move your eyes around a little bit um, mm -hmm. before you can tell that it's not real colors, but it's very um, convincing that you just saw a full color image. Wow. 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 Um, yeah. And I, uh, yeah, That's I like this one a lot because bizarre. it demonstrates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it de what does it demonstrate or? Um, it demonstrates the way that color interacts with uh, luminance. So essentially, um, what I was talking about before, the reason why we have so many L and M cones in our eyes are also so that we can see uh, luminance edges. Um, and those are kind of what our visual system is, in, is really based on seeing. So color is amazing and it's obviously my favorite, um, but really what's important to us are distinguishing edges and distinguishing objects from backgrounds and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so color kind of uh, tends to fill in toward these edges. And so these after image demonstrations work a whole lot better when you can combine them with something spatial. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, yeah. And then I guess uh, I did want to mention the McCulloch effect because sure. it's my favorite. If anybody wants to go do some reading, um, the McCulloch effect is this really interesting after image that, um, is semi-permanent. Mm. So what we were talking about before that most of the time uh, when you do these after effect demonstrations are really short term, yeah. but the McCulloch effect is really interesting because for some mysterious reason, if you do, if you look at the demonstration for five to 10 minutes, um, you can have an after effect that lasts for months or years. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you want to try it, you absolutely can. There are demonstrations on YouTube. Um, and essentially the way it works is that the adapting stimuli uh, are uh, two sets of gratings. One is vertical, one is horizontal, and they're switching back and forth. And one uh, grating is very colorful 
probably something like a red. And then the other grading is very colorful green. So when you switch back and forth from these two things for a while, and then you look at a black and white grading, now the uh, vertical grading will have the after image from the vertical color. So the vertical grading will look green and the horizontal grading will have the after image from the horizontal color. Um, it will look red. And um, it's really cool because number one, it essentially means that you're storing two different after images in your brain at the same time in the same location, oh, wow. which is kind of weird. And how does that work? I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the other very cool thing about it is, uh, like I said, it lasts for a really long time and we don't really know why you would have something in your brain that was so nearly permanent because then for months, whenever you see a black and white grading at about that same frequency, um, it'll look colorful to you. And Wait, so it's almost like it's stored for that specific pattern. Pattern, like it's that, that one particular spatial. image. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it's very specific. You really need these high contrast edges. So you, like a black and a bright color is the way it works best. Um, and you need to have this kind of switching for some reason. There's all these parts of it that need to really come together to make it work. Um, but then you get this weirdly permanent after image. And this is, it's my favorite because there's hardly any other examples of something like this. And um, people still don't have great explanations for why it lasts so long. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm studying right now is the McCullough effect. That's cool. I, I think almost as amazing as the actual effect is the fact that someone actually discovered it. This McCullough guy looks yeah. <laughs> Yes, so, actually. So highly uh, specific? <laughs> yeah, uh, her name is Celeste McCulloch, okay. and she's kind of a personal hero of mine because another cool thing she did was she wore colored lenses for 60 plus days <laughs> just, mm. just to see <laughs> what would happen. <laughs> And I just, uh, just speaks to me, speaks yeah, to my heart. That, that's actually something I wanted to ask you is, is if you've tried wearing colored lenses and, and how, what the, what's the longest you've gone with them? And I what think you I've are. done like 10 days when I did the yellow lens project, I did about 10 days in a row. Okay. Um, I've worn these red ones quite a bit, but not as much as, um, the grad student who I work with, she's, she's probably done, um, a lot more than me. Okay. Um, and there are people who wear these colored lenses kind of semi-permanently yeah. just, I, some people think that they're a good treatment for certain visual disorders. Mm -hmm. I'm not totally familiar with the research on that, but, uh, some people are prescribed colored lenses for certain visual disorders and some people just wear them for fun. Like, uh, gamers have, uh, yellow lenses that uh, sometimes they'll get in prescription <laughs> form mm -hmm. and they'll just wear them all the time. Um, so there are a number of people who do it not for science, but just mm -hmm. for funsies. Um, <laughs> for science. <laughs> yeah. But I have exposed myself to the McCulloch effect maybe as much as anybody else in the entire world <laughs> at this point. I've done it for hours and hours. And, hours. <laughs> and it doesn't your, affect your vision in any other way other than when you just go back to look at it again. Mm -hmm. You're just like, oh, this mm -hmm. is so cool. <laughs> I think yeah, I, I exactly. had a I think I had a brief glance at his paper because you do have it her in your reference. Or? Her paper. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Her paper. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody ever puts their pronouns in their sites. Oh yeah. We do? Well, and it's from <laughs> 1965. Yeah. So another reason why Celeste McCullough is one of my heroes because she was actually um, well. doing this work at a time when yeah. very few women did that work, and uh, she was, I think, the first female faculty in the sciences at Oberlin College or something. She like. Wow. But a pioneering did, person as well. And was she like I, I skimmed through a lot of a lot of the references trying to, you know, familiarize myself. But did she discuss the the issue of early computer programmers seeing, you know, because it was and I grew up on them, the green, you know, the black screen with the green lettering. And when you spent days and days and days and weeks and months that when you took your eyes off the screen, you sort of permanently saw white paper with pink lines. Yes. So this yeah. is, um, I don't think that's the reason why she did the study, mm -hmm. but shortly after this came out, mm -hmm. um, people kind of, uh, I think like five years later, people finally got really excited about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and part of why was because of that exact reason. Cause people were complaining that when they helped their kids with homework and they had lined paper, it looked really pink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a kind of an unintended effect. Cause they were just looking for readability because those early screens were just, they were bad, but yeah. it was it was sort of like the best compromise you could make for for just utility. 
Mm -hmm. Thank God for our, you know, ginormous screens today. We love them. Yeah. (laughs) But I'm sure it's still like people who program in Linux all the time might still kind of experience that stuff. I'm not sure. Mm. Cool. But, um, yeah, so the McCullough effect is another great one. And then um, finally, just a quick aside, adaptation happens in the visual domain in any number of dimensions. So um, you can experience these after effects with things like faces, uh, blur, uh, orientation. There's all kinds of different ways that you can experience these after effects. And so um, look how, those up because they're limited des- and fun. Could you describe how it would apply to faces? Yeah, so essentially what you could do is actually, if you want to pull up uh, the last slide that I have, um, well, essentially what people do is they manipulate a face in Photoshop um, in any number of ways. So for this example, they basically take the center of the face and they just squish it so that it looks like they have a very pinched nose and kind of close set eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you stare at that for a while, at first it looks really odd. Um, And then after a few seconds up to a minute, it looks like almost a completely normal face. Mm. And then when you go back and look at the original face, uh, it looks really big. It looks like his nose is too big and his eyes are too far apart. Mm. And you can do that with a number of facial dimensions. So people do it with gender. So you can take um, like a male face and a female face and kind of morph them together. And uh, after you stare at the female face for a long time, when you look at the morphed face, it looks really male. And if you look at the male face for a long time, when you look at the morphed face, it looks really female. Um, Yeah. So you can, I think it works with race. It works with um, all these different facial dimensions. So it's another fun thing. Cool. (laughs) All right. Got to have entertainment for the next two weeks. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Do you, do you all know about the illusion of the year contest? No. The, yeah, so it's a website that you can go to every year. They um, uh, mostly vision scientists, but sometimes just people from the community make uh, illusion demos and oh, upload wow. the videos. <laughs> and so you can go there and find all the winners. I think they've been doing it for like 15 years or something. So uh, yes. that'll uh, that's endless entertainment. Okay. It's fantastic. I know what I'm doing this so weekend. Many cool <laughs> yeah. You can you can garner the best of and send them to us. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, no, I'll I'll, oh. I'll try to find I'll find the link for that and I'll include that in the description too because I'm sure everyone will enjoy mm-hmm. <laughs> going to that. Yeah, it's really okay. fun. Well, I think I think that's good, Katie. Um, mm-hmm. Unless is there were there any other points you wanted to make or things you wanted to mention or cool things that come to mind or? I think that's, that's it pretty good. for me. But obviously, okay. I could talk about this forever. But right. thank you so much for <laughs> no, having for, me and inviting me. Yeah, thank you for coming. It was a, it was a blast. Yeah. Um, um, it's just such an interesting topic and even the things that you, you know, as a, as just a, a normal, like lay person looking at internet memes, you, you can only come across so much of the, of the good information. So I'm glad we got to talk to you and, uh, and find out the, the nitty gritty and see some really cool stuff that you've never seen before. Mm-hmm. So thank you. No, thank you. It was great. Yeah. It was great to meet you all. Okay. Well, okay. take care and thanks again. Okay. Bye, Katie.